So welcome everybody to the August 18th ETAC meeting. Um, the long eventful summer. I hope you all had a, some rest and restoration. Um, as Heather was mentioning earlier, we haven't met as a group since February. So uh, this will be a good check-in period. Um, just the, the ground rules that I think everybody knows, uh, if you want to talk, use your raise hand device if you can. That makes it easier for me if there are a number of people that want to talk. Um, and no chat on the chat line because this is a public meeting. And um, we've got our normal sort of uh, agenda items to start with. Um, We'll review the agenda here, and then we'll talk about approving our notes from the previous meeting in February. I'm sure all of you remember that in great detail. Um, and then we're gonna have uh, a recap of the growth monitoring uh, city council and planning commission meetings. And then we'll have a little more in-depth review of the dashboard. So, um, and, Heather, did you say there was a, um, a visitor? We do have an attendee on with us. So um, I don't know if you, we want to ask them if they are wanting to make a public comment at this time. And if so, if they would like to raise their hand. All right. Yes, we have a Caleb Barber. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let him speak or them speak. Okay, let's see. Hi, uh, my name's Caleb. I'm a reporter at the Daily Emerald, and I just wanted to sit in on this meeting just to understand what was going on a little bit better. This is my first time sitting in on a meeting about uh, Envision Eugene. So this is more of like an informational thing. I didn't really have much to share. Just kind of wanted to sit back and let, just learn a little bit. Great, thank you, Caleb, and welcome aboard for the meeting. Um, let's do the approval of the uh, February 17th Zoom meetings uh, minutes. Um, I move to approve the Zoom summer. I'll second. Second, seconded by Alexis. Alexis, all in favor? Oh, it looks like unanimous of those present. Great. All right, Heather or Elena, do you want to give us a recap of the planning commission and city council meetings? They were they were very. I I just want to give you guys a real um, uh, salute for the excellence of your presentations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and we very much appreciated having you there. I know that there weren't any ETAC um, specific questions, but I actually think that might have been a good thing. Um, so Elena, Kevin, and then of course, anyone else jump in. I'll just um, do my recap. Of course, I have notes on specific questions from planning commission and city council um, for planning commission if i were to step back and think about the discussion that was there um there and both both planning commission and city council students came up um there's always you know that's always going to be part of our conversation is what effect do students have and their enrollment on um, housing production and um, the way our housing is used and um, whether or not it's gonna go up or down based on enrollment. Um, so that was one specific question that I think we can look at potentially wrapping in um, to a comprehensive report in the future is some analysis of housing production compared to um, U of O enrollment. I don't, I mean, I don't know what we can, how that affects future policy in any way, but um, 
certainly if there is a relationship, which we didn't find immediately, which was kind of interesting um, when we did a first pass on it. But um, if there is a relationship, it will help us plan um, in the future, potentially some more. Um, we definitely heard uh, a lot of interest in the information, um, a feeling that the program was uh, really important and um, covered an immense amount of data that is going to be helpful going forward so that this is a good foundation. Much of what I heard from you all as we were reviewing the report um, and also echoing some of the things I heard from you all about having patience um, with the results, that this is our first report and that even though it seems like a number of years that, um, that it really isn't that many years in the grand scheme of things. And so really having patience, hi Ed, um, having patience uh, when not jumping to conclusions too quickly. Um, there were some ideas that I think um, will be helpful when we start looking at efficiency measures through the um, urban growth boundary um, analysis, so not part of growth monitoring, but part of that work, which is exactly what we want. We want this information to start generating those ideas for more housing production and how to use our land more efficiently. Um, and yeah, there were quite there were some questions just clarifying some points about the data, um, but not questioning the data, but just asking like about climate migration, you know, that question about um, how it is or isn't included in our population growth, things like that. Um, but a lot of it were things that we talked about um, at the ETAC. I didn't you know, I don't think that there was anything that was a real surprise. Um, does anyone want to say anything about uh, planning commission before I jump into city council that they observed or comments on that? I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I note I had, you know, housing availability, affordability. Uh, there were questions about infrastructure and the relationship of the um, city limits to the UGB and, and land that we're including in the inventory, but that's not in the city limits. Um, and, you know, that complexity that we've covered, um, efficiency measures, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say. Um... At city council, it was maybe a little bit different, um, which makes sense, a little bit different um, discussion, more about uh, things that might lead to policy. Um, <clears throat> again, there was discussion about um, student enrollment and student housing supply and how do we use our housing more efficiently? Um, is there housing that's sitting there vacant that's oriented towards students, but it's not being used? Um, but yeah, I would echo what Kevin said. There was a lot of conversation, which is great, about how the monitoring report showed that most development was occurring, particularly residential development, was occurring on flat land, not sloped land. Um, and also about how much of our future buildable land supply is unannexed and kind of that proxy that we assume that if it's unannexed, it probably a lot of that doesn't have infrastructure. And so um, I thought there was a great conversation um, touching on how do we fund infrastructure, how do we get it to our supply, that seems to be an issue, um, and, you know, what do we do about sloped land, um, and, there, you know, not really and I wouldn't expect that at this point, not really saying we should do this or we should come up with efficiency measures, but just recognizing the difficulty of building on slope land 
and that um, a significant portion of our supply is on sloped land. Um, and that's probably why some of it is not served yet either, because it costs more to serve that land. So um, that took up quite a bit of conversation, which was great. Um, it was really felt more like policy discussion or nibbling on the edges of policy discussion um, rather than focusing on how the data was collected. Um, you know, it kind of took the, it said, okay, here's the data, what do we do with it and how can it inform us in the future, which I thought was great. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Any other observations or I know it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually fairly impressed with um, the questions that the council members asked. Uh, you know, I would expect planning commission members to, you know, be able to get their fingers in the substantive material. But the councilors, uh, the council members, um, by and large, all had um, good questions. And that was, as others pointing out, was a very positive thing. Phil, you are still muted. There. Sorry, um, I did uh, listen to the last meeting uh, that I missed, but I wasn't able to join the planning commission or council um, work, uh, work sessions or, or watch them later. Did at either one of those meetings, were there questions about implications of House Bill 2001 and or the CFEC um, state rules or anything else that maybe was kind of talked about as like something real current and, and the implications going forward for maybe the next round or, or what it might mean to some of the trends? I do believe that at council, um, the CFEC question was raised right at the end, if I remember correctly, I believe Councillor Clark asked if we had any concerns about the CFEC rules. <laughs> and, um, you know, they were still in development at that point. Um, we had been submitting comments all along. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of a larger question. Um, but it wasn't specifically related to monitoring. Um, I know that the Planning Commission has asked about monitoring middle housing. Um, and we kind of hit that head on when we did the presentations where we mentioned that we know we're gonna, the next report is gonna, is going to have to replace some of our housing terminology to reflect the code changes for middle housing. Um, we're gonna be tracking middle housing types specifically. So we hit that head on, so, uh, hoping that that would um, mean that we wouldn't get a lot of questions about it because we knew it was a question. So I don't remember us dwelling on that too much because I think we addressed what, I, I think we addressed that concern. Any other questions? Well, why don't we then dive into the dashboard, dash into the dashboard. I just want to add one more thing. Um, in case we didn't make this clear, um, council unanimously approved the report. I know we sent out an email, but to all of your volunteer hours and looking at all of that data, I just cannot um, overemphasize the appreciation for your time and making such a solid, helping us make such a solid foundation as we move forward. Um, I, that was huge, and I'm I they all expressed appreciation as did the planning commission. So um, I just want to make sure that you all hear that again. So. <laughs> John. Okay, so I will ask a question and you may have the answer to this. Um, it's a piece of data that I think is gonna be useful and I don't know if it's captured in our reports, but in, um, <clears throat> in one of the motions that's going forward on electrification, 
there was reference to uh, new single family housing and low low rise residential buildings. Is that something that's captured in our data? Because I I haven't seen that. You know, it's low rise low rise multifamily would be uh, a natural gas prohibited if if the ordinance goes through as is proposed. And I'm just wondering if we're capturing that. And if we're not, I think it would be really a good piece of tool to start capturing that now before the uh, the effective date of June 30th, uh, 2023, so that we can have something to see if there is an effect on. I know we capture single family, but I don't know about separating it out into low, low level multifamily we have and we can we can definitely add this as a topic um we might want to talk about it some more but i can just say um we monitor all or our monitoring data includes all housing types right so we have single family townhouses duplexes triplexes fourplexes We'll now have cottage clusters, and then we'll have um, five units or more multifamily. Um, and then that's broken out by five to 19, 19 to, I can't remember, and then beyond. And so um, that's what we have right now. I'd have to look further at what we mean by low, low right. development. Um, and we need to talk further about, because um, I think there are going to be new requirements for, there are not, I think there are going to be new re requirements for monitoring out of the climate friendly and equitable communities rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we need to be strategic and um, figure out I and mean, efficient about what additional things we add for monitoring. And I'm not saying this isn't one of them. I'm just saying there there could be some dovetailing that happens with that work. I'm not, you know, I don't know yet, but um, but thank you for flagging that. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a term that was brought up in in the ordinance that or in the recommendation to the to the city manager. And it was a term that, I, you know, being on planning commission, I've seen multifamily and, and with this, it's, you know, multifamily, five or more and, and the different things, but it had nothing to do with height. And the one that the, the, or, or the ordinance that is proposed or the direction that they gave had to do with low rise residential development. And, and I don't know what that means. And I don't know if we're capturing that, but it would be, it would be good to find that out and figure out if we can capture it. So, well, I was just gonna ask John, what does he mean by low level single family? I don't, I've, I've not heard the terminology before. And um, I'm a little concerned that we start throwing this new jargon around and we don't have a real clear sense of what it means. And if we start including this language in the work that we're doing and nobody knows what it means, that's a mistake. So I would like to understand really what, I don't even know what you're talking about, John. <laughs> I've never heard this terminology before. So- Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that was something, same with me. When, when they proposed the or, uh, to move an ordinance to public hearing, and this is to, to uh, have no new natural gas infrastructure to new residential or, and the way it was, it was said was low, low level uh, multifamily, so not high rises. And, and again, I hadn't heard it either. And so I was just, I thought maybe that is a term that I didn't know and we might be capturing, but it's, it's what yeah. is going forward for a, a proposed uh, moratorium yeah, I, on new gas hiccups. I, I would just warn us to be careful about interjecting new terminology that is not referred to elsewhere um, and so I just want to be careful about that because it's confusing enough anyway. Um, and if we start throwing in new terminology that nobody knows what it means and it hasn't really been defined, I think it's a risk. So thank you, John. Dennis. 
You're muted, Dennis. <laughs> Give a moment to unmute myself. The specific language in the motion the council approved talks about single family and no more than three stories. And I suspect the intent was to capture something similar to the rules around middle housing. Um, and so it may behoove staff um, and or some of us when it gets to the hearing process to suggest that that might be a refinement. Because my sense that the council's intent when they put it at a, you know, no more than three stories, they were looking at something similar to the height language they were using in middle house housing. And you're right, um, Sue, that is problematic if it's not linked. Um, but they asked staff to come back with an ordinance. So this is something we may want to be passing on to staff right here um, is, you know, suggest to council that it be consistent with other rules. Um, you know, but I think that was council's intent, having set in on a number of those discussions. Thanks, Dennis. Bill? Yeah, my understanding is actually that it's not related to middle housing as much as it, I think it's trying to um, align with the state building code. And that the, uh, my understanding is that the council has not been interested in, in proposing an ordinance that would require an amendment or adjustment or exception or something like that, any forbearance from the state building code officials or you know whatever, but really something they could do themselves. And in doing so, I think that they can make these adjustments to the code and requirements that are wholly within the bounds of the city to do without changes to the state building code. And they do relate to the height of the, of the buildings for single families. So totally agree with what Sue's been saying. We don't wanna introduce new nomenclature tech or, and so forth. The reason why I was asking the first question I asked of, of staff was, I think we do wanna make sure that the city's um, building and permitting code system is able to capture both the information about how are we doing on middle housing and on, if again, it's a code related thing and hey, anything four stories and up is considered commercial, is in the commercial section of the state building code and not the residential section, okay. But just, you know, I think it's, it's point well taken that that John's making that we want to be able to, to evaluate and track what's the effect of, of these different interventions that we do. So how about we'll come back to you with this. First, we're all going to wave to Dennis's um, little partner that's there. Hi, little one. Hello. <laughs> um, and we'll come, we'll look into this more. Um, we'll come back to you. Um, and yeah, we'll just, we'll follow up and see what we can find out. Okay, thank you for bringing it to our attention. All right, I will dive into dashboard talk. Um, share my screen. All right. So we have been working on sort of phase one of the dashboard, which does have a limited scope. So the goal isn't to show all of the charts that we've included in the report or even show them in the exact way that they show up in the report. Um, but essentially we're pulling key data in in a way that's meant to be digestible for an online community level dashboard versus the reports that are intended to be much more data heavy. Um, so the dashboard kind of like to think of it as an executive summary. Um, it's grouped into four main topic areas. So we have population and jobs, housing development, employment development, and income and affordability. Um, and uh, let's see, we will be uh, updating the building permit data quarterly, and then the other data will be refreshed annually or as it's available um, or if it's available annually. So I'm going to go over that 
PDF that I shared with you all. But first, let's see, I'm going to share. Oops. Nope. This is where we need a drum roll. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> um, a preview of the population and jobs data on our website. So we have um, a section intro about population and jobs, which kind of summarizes the general takeaways about the data and how it relates to UGB planning for housing and jobs. And then we will have different tabs for each of those sections. But um, we start with sort of these bigger questions. So how fast are we growing and how fast are our jobs growing? So we have some intro text for the population charts. We've included some visuals, so images and some of the um, infographics that we had made. So you can see here, um, we've made some different modifications uh, to the charts as well. So in this one, uh, you can click on each of the jurisdictions here and it will load an update for you. Um, that way it doesn't get super long and go off the page um, or show different forecasts that may be confusing. Um, but yeah, you can toggle back and forth between the jurisdictions here. We have the annual population estimates and trend. And so there's hover over text here. So you can see different years um, and then the exact numbers. And then how fast are our jobs growing? Uh, again, a little bit of intro text to help the reader uh, read the charts um, and pictures and infographics. And then Again, we've made slight modifications to the charts um, as they appear in the report. So for example, for an unemployment rate, we are showing um, every five years on the x-axis instead of every single year. And I think it looks like Phil has his hand raised. Just a question. I'm sorry to, to break your, your momentum here, but on yep. the, the back on the one that had the annual population estimates and trend uh -huh. and I guess I printed this out and I was looking at it and I couldn't uh, that that solid uh, kind of gold colored line that wasn't reflected on the uh, legend and so I wasn't sure what it was relative to the growth based on historical trends is that just what what is that that solid line telling us the orange one here uh -huh. or the black or the black one no the orange one so the orange That's ones, the adopted a UGB forecast. Trend line for the adopted UGB. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay. and and on the one that you sent out, the it's red, not orange. That's why it's confusing. Okay. The legend. <laughs> yes. Um. But so this basically is we've used Tableau, so our data visualization software. Um, and embedded that into our uh, city web page, which is pretty cool. So this will also hamburger if we want to drop down the different questions. And then users will be able to download the data as well. So if you kind of click on the background of this chart here, let's see, and then hit these download buttons, you can download the data shows us each of the years and unemployment rate. And then you can also download that as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so pretty exciting, working our way there. That's our first, um, first one that we've gotten up and running at the moment. And so now I will go back to this Word document. So and kind of just walk through briefly some of the uh, other topic areas and the dates, the charts that we're planning to highlight in those areas. So for housing development, bigger, bigger questions are what types of housing development have we seen and how much land has been developed? Have a section intro for that. Um, and then the charts we're including are dwellings on average per year. number and percent of dwellings by housing mix, 
dwellings by mix percent of need met, dwellings by efficiency measure and plan designation, average net density of dwellings by plan designation, average net density of dwellings by housing subcategory. There's lots, this is where all of our charts are, <laughs> lots of housing charts. We know that's what people are really interested in as well. So um, we will also will be adding average net density of middle housing dwellings. So that's in the works, something that we are working on um, to adjust to our new middle housing laws. Um, acres developed by BLI category and plan designation. And again, we have a little bit of text um, up above some of these groupings of charts to help the reader understand the information. And these will all be, um, the, that toggle. Um, so there's a bunch of charts, it's, it's all long, but there'll be toggles when there's, um, different plan designations here. So for commercial and high density residential and whatnot, including more infographics and pictures, as well as the maps of the new dwellings permitted. Um, so I have that rem reminder that looked looks like looks like this. Whoops, if it's if it'll let me load, but including these maps as well. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can go um, and keep going through these. I don't know if people had a chance to read over any of this or if there's any feedback at the moment. There's one specific question and I did want to get your opinions on. Um, so for under, let's see. under income and affordability. So right now we just have median household income and median sales price. So I wanted to note that a lot of the affordability data um, like cost burden households um, all comes from the census, which we currently have in SSRS, which is a, a different program. And so we're working on integrating that data into Tableau so that we can start to include some of those additional charts onto the dashboard, but for now we have median in income and median sales price of single family um, housing by city. So I will, before I get to that one question, I'll ask Ed what his question is or comment. Okay. Uh, would you mind going back to the housing mix? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, making everybody dizzy, probably. <laughs> it was about the fourth page, maybe. Mm -hmm. This one, the number percentage of dwellings by housing mix. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure. So one question that, yeah, I wanted to get your opinions on was, um, so for median household income coming from the census, uh, we have one year ACS data for Eugene, Lane County, and Oregon, but for the other local jurisdictions, we only have five year ACS data. Um, and so I've just been wrestling with whether to only include Eugene, Lane County, and Oregon, or to also include um, a filter to include those other jurisdictions. If we do include the other jurisdictions, um, the income number for Eugene and Lane County and Oregon will show up differently because that five-year ACS data is different than the one-year ACS data. Um, and I thought that may be confusing and that maybe just sticking with Eugene, Lane County, and Oregon on the dashboard might be okay since we have that other local jurisdiction information in the report if people are 
are interested in that. But um, any thoughts? I think for me, just leaving the three and then maybe a link to the others with, a, with a, just a footnote or something at the bottom of that page might work. Okay. Dennis. Poor Phil. Dennis, you're muted. Um, it seems to me that maybe some of that data could be used in a line graph, a line, a line graph, um, because whether you've got you know points on that line every five years or the points are annual points, it would still form a line that would give people a visual comparison if it was represented that way. Does that make sense? Um, it's not gonna it's not gonna compare if your bar graphs unless you're doing five years compared to one years, but if you're you know, doing some line graphs over a more extended time period, it could reflect that, that data from other jurisdictions. I know some of the line graphs that are elsewhere in the report, you know, do those broader comparison, Eugene's Springfield Cottage Grove at all. So just a thought, you know, to ponder. Okay, thanks. Phil? Um, I inclined to trust your instincts and I think you're correct I mean if you've got these three you know Eugene Lane County Oregon and five year increment you know five year data I think that's what you want to show John's probably right too that if people want to geek out on the other communities maybe there's a link to it or something I guess uh, just an observation or a question and I, I know that you guys have you know got a very coherent way of illustrating this data and and what type of data, but I do have to say, I think, you know, and it could be a little different if somebody's hovering over this looking on a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be different than if, like, look, I printed this thing out. But, um, uh, you know, like on the employment data, there's uh, the chart that you have about employment permits by subcategory. Mm -hmm. And the different shades of blue are just, you know, so the, they're so subtle uh, between the different um, categories there and, and it may be hard for people to kind of pick up unless you really kind of pour over which is which. Um, I just don't know that there are different hues of blue. Um, similarly, on the median sales price of single family housing by city at the end, um, they're all kind of different shades of tan, brown, orange. Uh, you did put a little uh, doohick about, you know, the symbol that goes with each city, but still a little bit tough to to read unless you're really kind of looking on on the computer and hovering over it. So I don't know if there's yeah. anything to be done about that, but I'll just. Yeah. I will say, yeah, I mean, the hover over will be at least helpful for those who may have trouble uh, differentiating between the colors. I don't know if Heather has anything else to say. I know that we, we colors were a large, large, large conversation uh, at the beginning of this process. I think that lasted a long time. Um, and I don't know that we plan to revisit that. <laughs> but <laughs> and I will say that um, Jennifer Knapp, who was our urban designer and also our publishing group guru, um, read in between the lines, color aficionado. <laughs> um, she has left. And then um, the person in our um, tech department, who was our other color guru has retired. And so, <laughs> um, so I'm not saying we're not going to revisit the colors at some point because it's certainly been an, a challenge. Um, that's actually the benefit of having the dashboard, like Elena said, it's, it's actually better than the reports because you can hover over it and just get, you can tell right away what is, um, government and semi-public you know it says that gives you the number and the year and everything which is great um it is a challenge for the printed reports it does remind me though that we did do a how to read these charts um in the report that might be something that would be helpful to put on the website because one of the things that we did 
um, is that the colors go from left to right in the legend and the same color scheme goes from bottom to top in the bars. And so that's always consistent. Um, and we explain that in the how to read our charts. So we could do some, we could add something like that as well um, for the dashboard. It's a, I know I, I hate to push that off because I know that it always comes up and I you are not the only one. We heard that about the grays too. The grays are really challenging. So, um, so we're definitely aware and we'll see what we can do about it. Howard. Yeah, uh, with respect to uh, charts, I uh, know it's a, a challenge to uh, try to come up with graphics that uh, uh, is relatable to different audiences. But if this is kind of a community dashboard, I guess I would favor keeping it as uh, informative, but also simple. And if people want to do a deep dive into data, uh, you know, we, you know, you certainly can provide them links to do that. But, um, you know, if you get some of these charts or line graphs or whatever, you get too much data on it, it starts to become pretty muddled. And I think for some people, their eyes are going to glaze over and and uh, not look at it. So I, I guess I would err on keeping them more simple than complex. Thanks, Howard. Kevin. Kevin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, the relationship between left to right and bottom to top is a reach a little bit. Um, and I wonder if you could put the legend off to the right so that the stacking of the colors, it'll be, it just, it'll be intuitive <clears throat> that the colors work consecutive, you know, in a, in a relationship to stacking. Um, I mean, I kind of figured out the left to right thing. The Economist magazine uses subtle colors too all the time. And they that's kind of how they do it is that they, you know, stack them in a certain way and you just got to figure that out. But um, because the graphs are bottom to top, if the legend were bottom to top, I think it would be intuitively clearer, but that may not work with your page format. I realize that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that that's an option or not in Tableau, but um, it may be. So, yeah, thank you. Sue. So I have a question about the sources. Um, when you look at the sources on page like 12 and 13, mm -hmm. as an example, you have um, City of Eugene Planning and Development Department, Building Permits and Community Development Databases. And then you have, that's for 2012 to 2021, and then you have 2013 to 2032 trend, City of Eugene Planning and Development Department building permits community development. So basically it's the same source. So can you, can you tell me the difference? Um, who, who determined the trend? Um, how is it different from, or how is it sourced from the actual data? I'm gonna let you jump in on that, Heather. Yeah, so the reason it's the same source um, is that the trend is saying, okay, if the 2012 to 2021 data continued out the 20 year period, oh. then that's the trend. And so okay. it's using the same data from 2012 to 21 and just projecting it out. Great. That's exactly what I needed to know. Thank you. But I do think that's a great point, Sue, that um, these are some examples of things where we could have a um, how to read this data, how to use these charts mm -hmm. intro, <laughs> intro section um, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere on the dashboard to help with this stuff. I also wanted to mention at this point, we haven't changed any of the data. And so all of this data is still exactly what you saw in the reports. We have not updated any of the data yet. We've been um, 
working on the dashboard, working on middle housing. And so we have it, and we'll talk more about that with next steps, but I just wanted to let you all know that the changes Elena identified are really more about formatting to, to make it more simple or simplified or easier for a web audience, um, but none of the data has changed yet. So I just kind of wanted to mention that. So I don't know if anyone has any more questions about specific charts or why we included something or why we didn't include something at this point. And if not, John. No, I think it I think it's great. And I think that when you showed us the the rollovers on the on the actual website mm -hmm. i think that's fabulous i think you know that that turns this into a living document for for me it would really turn it into a living document and something that you could you could uh get stuck with on for hours i mean it's it's the youtube of of uh <laughs> growth monitoring <laughs> it just sucks you in or the tick tock let's 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 call it that it's the tick tock of reports in the city and I think it's just fabulous. I think that this is a template that is just unbelievable. And I can't believe the work that you guys have done on it. It's just fantastic. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, John. Kevin. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges with uh, website data and reports is the lack of an easy way to tell the date of the of the um the article or the the, the information mm -hmm. and i'm wondering um if there's a way to put like a header or something in the html coding to where you can always see that this this is the you know the august 2022 uh dashboard because you won't be i'm, I'm assuming you're not going to sort of have this data live changing day to day you're going to you're going to be updating it when you do the report and this is the kind of the as you said executive summary um, kind of interested public interface for that but it would just be i think um useful because if we get into a period where there's some rapid change or something um people will go to this and, and it'll mm -hmm. look like well, that's, you know, this doesn't reflect reality. Well, this was August 2022 or, you know, whatever the date is. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could do that. And maybe it's on the the, the homepage um, where it's, you make it really clear. Right. This is the date and, and, it, and it will be updated um, at some, you know, on an annual basis or something. So that... Yeah manage expectations. I think we are hoping to have our building permit data updated more regularly, um, potentially quarterly. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily align with when the new reports are finalized, but um, I definitely hear you in terms of trying to figure out how to make it clear how uh, up to date the data is um and so. i i um just want to add on to that i mean that's it's a really good point i mean right now these graphics and everything are related to the report because we just did it um but like elena said we are planning because that was what was asked for originally was to have more up to date building permit data it's not it's not of the moment which i think was the original ask um because there's a lot there's still a lot of manual review we have to do to um before it gets released onto the web but but that was our goal was to have more current data on the website and so it does strike me a little bit that the way that we've designed this is really here's what's in the report and um we are going to have to be really clear that we have a report out there that is different than what's on this dashboard 
Um, and that includes the infographics. We're going to have to really make sure, you know, we can't have infographics that relate to the report and not to the data in the charts, you know. So, um, for instance, population growth, you know, we're going to get a new population estimate in 20, you know, at the end of this year. And so that chart is now going to change in January, right? And so it will be different than what's in the report. So um, I don't know that I have thought about that issue yet. So thank you for raising it. <laughs> Sue. So I think this is just an incredible piece of work. Um, the thing that I like the best about it is that it is so easy for anybody to use. So if you're just a visually oriented person, you can look at the um, headline at the top of a page, dwellings on average per year, and you can look at the chart and you can get an idea. If you want more information than that, you can go so much deeper and the whole interactive ability of it is phenomenal. So I think this really does the job for the public in providing a document that is accessible to a lot of different people. You know, I'm, I am very visually oriented myself. I loved looking through this really quickly in the beginning and just kind of getting a sense for each category of what the trends were and what's happening now. Um, and I think for a lot of people that's gonna be sufficient, but for anybody who wants to go further than that, there's just so much capacity. And I, I think it's amazing. Um, it is so loaded with information, and yet I think it's accessible. So great, great work. Dennis. I just want to add to the kudos. And uh, I said in some of these prior meetings, uh, um, I'd have less familiarity with this kind of data when I started this process than other folks have. Um, and I'm finding it accessible. So if you're looking for your, you know, representative of a lay person that doesn't know this kind of data very well, it is accessible to someone like that, because that's who I am. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I'll pop over. Um, as I mentioned, this is sort of phase one. So phase two will be the same main four topic areas. Um, I also mentioned that there's a number of charts that aren't in Tableau yet that we need to convert over. Um, and so there will be some more key data points and charts that we will continue to add. And just wanted to share, this is Minneapolis. So this is, we're trying to uh, get inspiration from Minneapolis and Seattle's dashboards. So super interactive, um, super easy to navigate. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think we mentioned too, we are working with some formatting constraints and with uh, constraints on our web server host and uh, width of the screen and things like that. So um, we're we're navigating all of that and trying to uh, we'll try to update it in in phase two with a little bit more maybe a little bit more jazz and and more charts and more key data. So hand it over to Heather. Um, well, we really appreciate your feedback. Um, I, we will definitely pass that on as well to our tech staff because um, our information services division, um, you know, has been instrumental behind all of this. And I mentioned um, one of the folks that retired, um, the last thing he did was kind of set us up for this dashboard. And um, he has been our database um, kind of guru in the background um, with Tableau. And so having him do this final push to get a framework for um, transferring data from Tableau to a website, which in my mind was just like, oh, can't you just point to the chart? No, that is not how it works. Of course, I always oversimplify in my mind. Um, 
but his putting that framework together before he retired was huge. Um, and I as and our um, tech staff have really just um, run with it. So I will, they will be really happy to hear that. I know they were very interested in your feedback. Um, so we'll be glad to share this with them next week. So um, Dennis, I, your hand's still up. You don't have an additional question, right? I just wanted to make sure uh, our dashboard stuff was, okay, great. Um, so next step, so as I mentioned, we are um, in the middle of uh, revising databases. Um, actually, we're kind of wrapping up revising our databases to incorporate the new language and make sure that we're capturing middle housing uses um, better. You know, there's new uses now. Cottage cluster is middle housing. Um, there are, you know, our plexes, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes can now be attached or detached. <laughs> um, and uh, there are new credits for parking um, for your minimum off-street parking requirements. There's new credits where you can reduce those minimums. And so there's a bunch of um, work that we've been working on to try to update our tracking systems. And the next phase is really going back into any charts that are reporting by housing mix or housing type subcategory and replacing all of the terminology. Um, so row house is now townhouse, um, single family unit is now single unit. Um, and then things like um, duplex, triplex and fourplex are all middle housing. They're in the middle housing, housing mix classi classification. So uh, that's all to say that it's taken a lot longer than we thought it was going to, big surprise. Um, I should add probably like 50% instead of 20% with everything with, the, with growth monitoring because it's always so complicated. Um, but the good news is, is we're at the charts. And so we'll be bringing those to you so you can see the updates. Um, finishing phase one of the dashboard development. So like Elena was showing, we've got population and employment, um, but we need to build out the rest of the topics that were in the Word document we sent you. Um, and all of this work and doing the report, actually putting the report together and going to planning commission and city council has, mean, has meant that we paused on reviewing building permit data. And so we have a backlog um, that we need to go through. Um, and mostly it's just checking to make sure that everything's coming in correctly. We know there are some things that um, the data um, system can't automatically do correctly. There's some manual things we have to do. Um, so we need to do that work. Um, we still have a backlog of refinements that you all gave us comments on way back when <laughs> um, of changes or refinements to existing um, charts. So we need to work on those before we start new charts. Um, Recruitment, um, that's another thing that I've had to kind of put on hold since we've had all of this other stuff going on. Um, but at some point we are gonna, uh, when I have, we have a moment to breathe, um, we'll um, figure out when we're gonna do recruitment um, for, uh, as you know, Ed is planning on um, retiring from the ETAC and we have been really lucky that he has stayed on. Um, and then we also need to prep for our 2022 annual report. So it's really our first annual report. Um, we're hoping to uh, do that sometime in the spring. Um, that, so we would be bringing it to you probably in the winter and then um, forwarding it to planning commission and city council in the spring. So there's a lot to do. Um, meanwhile, as you all have mentioned, there's other things going on like the climate friendly and equitable communities work, um, urban reserves, 
So urban reserves is moving forward. Um, there's just that it's been quiet because we've been doing a lot of writing findings and a lot of the um, document development for actually doing the first public hearing on urban reserves. And so, as you know, we sent out um, a poll about who all could meet for September 22nd or October 6th to get an urban reserves update before um, we go into um, work sessions where we're providing an overview to Lane County and Eugene Planning Commissions ahead of their public hearings. Um, I think we were going to ask is that if there's anyone on this, I was going to say call, <laughs> if there's anyone in this meeting that has not responded to Elena's email about September 22nd, your availability for a September 22nd um, or October 6th meeting, if you could email Elena um, as soon as we're done with this meeting, that would be great. So I never, yeah, I never asked about October 6th. We were just asking about September 22nd. So um, we'll send out a follow-up email maybe. Sounds good. <laughs> but yeah, this would be replacing the September 15th meeting because Rebecca can't make that meeting um, and being the project manager, pretty important for her to um, be there. Um. Yeah, and so I think we're at least planning on coming back to you in November, December with growth monitoring. Something on the next up list um, would be then, um, but it's very likely that um, there would be a meeting before that. I just, it's with so much going on right now, it's hard to forecast um, what will be going on at that meeting and when exactly it will be. So any questions on what's what's going on, what we're doing, <laughs> um, the ETAC schedule or, or anything like that? Ed? Thank you. Um, I think the dashboard looks great. Keep up the good work. Um, I'd like to go back to the report and the appendixes at this point. Um, I could be really, you know, I was a little concerned about the timeline and was trying to learn more about that and found the timeline in the report in the latter part of it. And uh, it said, for more information, go to appendix C with a different title. And I think, wow, it'd really be neat for that to be a live link just to take you right to the appendix where you could read that, if that's at all possible. And uh, I haven't done my homework yet, but I am a little concerned about the timeline and I'm looking for some clarity on that. But that's it. Uh, can I ask a follow up? So what what about the timeline are you concerned about? Now, one part I saw, it looked like we may not be looking at an urban growth boundary expansion until 2026 or something like that. Right. So that would be something that um, we could potentially wrap into the urban reserves update. But basically, um, the state has now put us on a rolling um housing needs analysis that we have to do every eight years, I think it is. And so ours is due for adoption no later than 2026, um, which if you back that up, <laughs> um, we really need to start the urban growth boundary review um, as soon as we can. However, one of the things that's going on is the state is also working on amendments um, to the urban growth boundary review process. And so um, some of those will actually are intended to make urban growth boundary review process um, more efficient um, and and I can, we can, this is something I can go back over with you guys, just so you have um, some timelines about this, but I'm actually sitting on one of the committees um, for the state that is 
looking at the rules around urban growth boundary review, how to make them more efficient, um, how to make them less um, uh, litigious. Um, and because it takes a lot of energy, not just from cities, but um, advocacy groups, residents, you name it. And so they so they they got direction from the legislature to really look relook at um, particularly for how we do our housing analysis. Um, and so while I say we need to start as soon as possible, there's work going on to actually make that review more efficient. And so we want that to get completed before we start anything and then have to redo it. Um, so anyway, that our, that's our drop dead deadline. It doesn't mean that's when we would adopt a new UGB by, it just that's our drop dead deadline. So that's all that timeline was trying to show. Sorry, that was very long winded. But very clear. Phil. I just want to um, echo uh, what others have been saying, tip my hat to staff for just such an outstanding job on these materials and, and how you've been able to kind of boil down such complex stuff into something that's, that's quite legible and understandable. So I appreciate that. I'm a little concerned and I'm so glad to hear that you're on this committee and that there's efforts underway to try to make uh, UGB review a little bit more efficient, which I think is, is good for everybody involved. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned just about the, the CFEC uh, rules and its implications for your ability to do other things that certainly had already been in the queue and directed as a matter of policy from the council, this, these projects and, uh, of implementation of a vision regime being uh, included, but hopefully maybe maybe all of this work actually works to your advantage to be able to comply and meet with those those rules as well. And you're you're ahead of the game from a lot of other communities. That's our hope for sure, <laughs> um, because there are reporting requirements coming out of that and the other work, and so um, I I feel bad for jurisdictions that don't have the capacity or already aren't trying to set up automated reporting. Um, I will just put a plug next Tuesday. Um, we are doing an overview to the Planning Commission of the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities rules. Um, so if you're interested in um, hearing more about that at a high level, um, it is next Tuesday night. Great. Any other questions? Comments? Well, thank you, everybody. Particularly thank Heather and Elena for your incredible work. And um, I guess we'll bring this meeting to a close and we'll see you all on September or October, whichever date turns out to be. Yep, Works okay. best for everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Happy All summer. Right.